just to the uh, the the Facebook viewers out there. So I'm just like doing a, a formal greeting. Um, so for the last, we have been, we mean we have been doing this uh, live for the last I would say from the first MCO until today. I think we we done more more than tens. I think close to twenty or maybe more than that. I mean I've never kept count on that. So every time the, that we do this kind um, this kind of session, so we. Uh, we always try to give our best and then try to bring a uh, different kind of like um, uh, input topics to the people out there so for those who have been following us uh, last week we have a santai session where we're actually talking more on the convi i mean uh, all uh, the, F the the common faq the in the malaysian industry and the malaysian drone industry and then uh, the last two weeks we actually managed to get uh, cam uh, Magic and uh, DRZ Iskandar to share with us what are the initiative about the on the drone uh, industry in Malaysia. So perhaps uh, next week uh, we will have um, next week and next two weeks and the following weeks uh, we will have more session like this. So for today, uh, for today uh, we gonna touch uh, we're gonna talk about drone application uh, in aerial surveillance. So because um. I mean, we know that. I mean, um, we all know that drone can be using to take photos and videos. But what are the extensive application that you guys can use, especially in the aerial surveillance? Because the common question, I, I mean, that common question that um, when people ask, okay, what else that drone can be can, can I mean can can be doing, uh, can do. So um, I mean, um, so in today's session, I actually bring, uh, I bring in uh, Mr. Eddie Bennett. Uh, let me feature him in the screen now. Alright, uh, this is Mr. Eddie Bennett. He's from uh, Complete AUV from Australia. So today, um, I mean the the I mean the session will be him where he's gonna talk about a uh, little bit about his background, uh, about his company background, and then what he's been doing. Uh, what are the current uh, situation in Australia uh, with regards to the um, drones regulations and whatnot? Because I believe some of you guys actually. Um, We'll ask this kind of like question or maybe have this kind of like uh, thought or question about uh, how how Australia actually handling the drone operation there. Uh, he will give a little bit of insight on that. And then um, he will talk about the drone uh, application in area surveillance, particularly in uh, in Australian environment, in Australian situation. Some of the use cases that he's going to share uh, is some, some of the use cases that he's going to share today will be uh, the first, I mean, there will be actually the first use cases that um, uh, use in the world worldwide. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, at the end of this session, then we will open to the uh, Q&A. So for those who are in the Zoom meeting room, uh, please uh, put in your question through the chat box. And then same goes to the Facebook Live uh, vid, uh, audience. You can put in your comment and then we will pick it up from, from time to time. So, um, one second. All right. So, um, yep. And then, um, um, without further ado, let me let me let me introduce a bit uh, about Mr. Eddie Bennett. So, Mr. Eddie Bennett is uh, the director and chief for Complete AUV, which is uh, an Australian Civil Aviation Safety Authority licensed commercial operator and training organization for unmanned aircraft. So basically, uh, in Australia, they have this uh, certified uh, commercial operator and training organization that are being uh, recognized or certified by the uh, by CASA, Civil Aviation Safety Authority Australia. So he's the director and chief pilot for Complete AUV, one of the training organization and the commercial operator. And he's been involved, uh, he has been involved in aviation since 1983 as crew chief and director of operation for both government and civilian search and rescue uh, so this is the thing that um i mean yeah, quite interesting uh, he will talk about more we talk he will talk more on this uh, later and aeromedical services and he's been working at senior management level with state police and emergency services for uh, over 35 years uh, he was responsible for the development of the westpac surf life saving drone rescue and artificial intelligence programs now operating across australia and the world's first drone rescue of two people in cyclonic seas in 2018. He has received many Australian awards, including the National Bravery Medal, National Sea Safety Award, National Service Medal, and Police Valor Award, and is a Justice of the Peace. Uh, so, uh, kalau dalam bahasa Malaysia ni, banyak dunia pingat ataupun jasa kebaktian ni. 
Alright, um, so he's a member of the International Association of Emergency Managers and Australian Institute of Emergency Services. He's a co-author of NASA's Transformative Vertical Flight White Paper titled Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing, eVTOL. Uh, so for those who would like to know more about eVTOL, maybe after this session you can, uh, you can, you can reach out to Mr. Eddie Bennett. Um, so focus, I mean, this white paper actually focusing on application of passenger carrying unman, unmanned aircraft for public safety operation. Uh, so, I mean, kalau dalam bahasa Malaysia dia, kalau orang Malaysia kata kereta terbang. Uh, so, uh, this is something that you want to explore further with uh, Mr. Eddie Bennett. And last but not least, he has extensive operational experience in unmanned aircraft and their application in, ver in varied surve uh, surveillance roles. So, uh, without further ado, uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Eddie Bennett to take over the session and start your sharing. Please welcome. Thanks very much, Safiq, for that. And um, it's certainly wonderful to be here today to be able to talk to everyone. Um, I'm particularly uh, passionate about this subject um, because I think that uh, the technology um, is advancing very quickly and the use case for that is going to be able to provide tremendous good for everyone, um, not only in Australia, but uh, across the world as well. And certainly from my visits previously to Malaysia, I think you have a very enthusiastic approach to um, unmanned aircraft and uh, have a very exciting future in that area. So I'll share my screen now and uh, um, take you through um, this presentation. Now, uh, what I wanted to do today was show you some of the pictures and videos about things that over the last five or six years we've uh, been involved in here. And uh, we've been very fortunate with the opportunities we've been, been given uh, to progress these. So uh, first of all, but as Fig said, I, I, I thought I'd give you a bit of an understanding about what's happening in the in the regulatory world here with the government and the future direction of the Australian government um, with unmanned aircraft. So first of all, um, should I get this to work? First of all, um, across the world now, we very have very high adoption rates of technology. Um, recently, um, our federal government uh, commissioned a report through uh, Deloitte, which is an international um, research organisation. And this is some of the statistics they came with. And if we look historically, first of all, about technology and what is really disruptive technology, the internet was disruptive technology, uh, mobile phones, uh, all those things are disruptive technology and drones are certainly disruptive technology now. So you can see on the um, screen here, the very high adoption rates over a short period of time for technology. Now, in that report, they have many, many um, screens that they, they share with us. But I just wanted to show one here on the right-hand side, which is about government services. Because historically, we think that government is one of the um, slower adopters of new technology, and it goes to the commercial world to adopt it. But when you compare the rates of adoption of drone technology across all the different sectors, the government rates um, were quite high. And the interesting point is that they say in Australia here, we'll be at saturation levels for people and the use cases for those by 2040, which is not that far away now. So uh, we're going to see a rapid increase in the use of this. So one of the challenges we had here too was um, the access of this technology uh, for everyone. And uh, we became, with um, particularly the youth and engaging in this in for photography and social and recreational purposes, um, in, in using drone technology. Um, the challenge was how we could turn that, uh, that enthusiasm and those use cases into uh, improving commercial outcomes and, and society as well. So, so in September uh, last year, the federal government, the Australian federal government, released a discussion paper about emerging aviation technologies. It focused on two things. Uh, drones or unmanned aircraft and what was mentioned before EV toll aircraft which is electric vertical takeoff and landing and essentially that is passenger carrying vehicles so they whole focus of this discussion which is now a national discussion is how do we capture this technology 
and apply it for the good of society here and make it in an efficient and economical uh, manner. So there's a very active discussion happening now uh, in Australia. And we recognised, of course, the many different areas that the technology could apply to. Now, I think most people will realise that uh, drone technology can be applied across many, if not uh, in any type of industry. But the one thing that we learned over the last five or six years was about what I call the smooth pathway. Um, and that's by using drones for good or humanitarian purposes and helping people. Uh, when we first got into uh, launching the drone applications in Australia, um, we wanted to fly these drones over areas where there were people and basically um, all the regulations that existed at that time, we were proposing to do something that was not permissible under the regulations. But because that project was about saving lives uh, in, the, in the ocean rescue scenario, it was deemed to be humanitarian assistance, we were given um, a lot of support by the government to be able to um, do it. And they've since now been able to adapt the regulations to allow a much greater use of drones in a greater, greater number of situations. So out of all the things there, the starting point for us was about offering humanitarian assistance through a search and rescue platform. So in this discussion paper, um, we've actually identified in Australia um, three horizons. And um, during those uh, periods, and they go five years, five to 10 years, and then 15 to 30 years. And um, you can see there that in that first horizon, uh, we're already underway with that, where we have trials of new types of aircraft and services. And uh, they're happening now at a number of locations around Australia. And one of the particular things that they're doing now is beyond visual line of sight. So that means um, visual line of sight is when you can see the, see the drone, beyond line of sight. We now have operations that are going up to 130 kilometres in these um, trial stages. So in that next five to 10 years, that industry will mature. We'll see these services expanded the number of locations uh, continue. But our government and uh, the industry here is saying that in that horizon three, in the next 15 to 30 years, we believe that drone applications and the use cases and the number of those services in this country uh, will be quite commonplace. Essentially, we believe that uh, they're going to be operating in all industries across all levels of society. So one of the things that that presents as a challenge is how you integrate that into society and how do you integrate it into the current national airspace management practices. So uh, that horizon three in the 15 to 30 year bracket is saying that we expect to have a fully integrated aviation system. Um, over the last three years, uh, Project One Sky in Australia has achieved the first steps, which is the integration of civilian and uh, military air traffic control. And uh, as recent as two months ago, the first request for proposals for an unmanned traffic management system were released out to, uh, out to the public arena. And uh, that program over the next few years is to integrate those services. So we not only realise that the technology itself can uh, offer a lot of uh, great advantage, we have to have the regulatory environment and the infrastructure to support that in, in an integrated manner. So um, I'll just quickly talk about the drone structure here. Um, we divide it essentially into two uh, brackets, recreation, flying for fun, or commercial activities. So if you fly a drone for uh, earning an income or for a company, it has it's considered a commercial activity and the drone has to be registered. So all commercial drones are registered in, in Australia now. And if you operate on a commercial basis, you have to either have a, an accreditation, uh, which is for a drone that is under two kilograms of weight. Above that, you have to be licensed. And then the restrictions that are placed as a common standard, uh, we call them the standard operating conditions, and uh, visual line of sight, no greater than 400 feet, daytime only. And then there are restrictions about distances from people, um, airspace that is prohibited or restricted, populous area, which is an urban or a built up area. Uh, we have restrictions around controlled aerodromes and uh, around emergency operations and the number of drones that can be operated. So they're the general rules. If you then become a commercial operator with a license, um, that allows you to do things that are outside of the standard operating conditions. I think the common thing that we've realised here or what the regulations focus on is, first of all, 
a drone or an unmanned aircraft, by definition in this country, um, is, is an aircraft. The same as a passenger carrying a public transport airport, a drone is an aircraft. The person operating that is a pilot and it is flying in the national airspace. So we need to be able to integrate that. Uh, so no matter what type of operation you're doing or what use case or what benefit is there, there are currently restrictions on where you can fly those drones. And here, generally it is in that yellow band, which is class G airspace. And uh, that is generally the area that you can only fly the drones. So not near uh, airports is the, uh, is the common thing. However, we realise that that's a challenge that needs to be able to change and not only fly near the airports, but be able to integrate the drone into the same traffic patterns as the manned aircraft or crewed aircraft are flying. So when we look at flight planning in its simplest form, for current people who are uh, looking at trying to plan a flight and you deal with a, uh, an aviation chart, it can become quite complex. So one of the things that's happened here is we now have um, unmanned uh, unmanned traffic um, flight planning software. So we can go to anywhere in Australia and put a pin on a map and it'll be able to tell us whether we can fly there or not and identify the airspace. So that um, reddish area is within that 5.5 kilometres of a controlled aerodrome, so you're not able to fly there under the simplest, um, under the simplest concepts of the standard operating conditions. So if you're a commercial operator, however, there is a trial underway now which is about automated airspace approvals. So that airport where there's three trials happening here at the moment around major capital cities, what you're seeing now is the airspace around Canberra Airport, which is Australia's capital city. And in that blue area is uh, restricted airspace or controlled airspace. So it becomes very difficult to get an approval to fly there. So what they've recognised now is that for commercial operators, um, they've simplified the process on this screen, I can hit the request button here. The request button simply takes me to an area that I identify to fly. I put in my approval to fly. And then uh, the next step of that is it goes straight into the air traffic control system, the same as a crewed aircraft or a manned aircraft, and uh, I get approval to fly there. So the capability of the technology and the use cases needs to be supported by the regulatory environment. And uh, that's happening and, and seems to be happening quite well at the moment. Um, what that allows us to do then is to fly in areas around built up areas or urban areas or cities. And we have the Google Wing project here operating now, which is, is doing deliveries um, around one of our major cities. And uh, we also are now, with the approval of CASA, uh, able to do beyond visual line of sight flights. And it is starting to use virtual or augmented reality as well for the flight planning at the very least. So there's a lot happening in this country um, at the moment. And if the regulatory environment remained purely uh, restrictive, it, then the technology and the use cases are not going to advance. So um, I'm pretty happy. I'm happy with where we are at the moment and the direction we're taking. Of course, there's still going to be a very rapid learning curve on some things, but um, the two things, the foundation principles of everything we, we do here, uh, is about safety and is about being legal with the operations. So that's a bit of an oversight of what we're doing at the moment and where it's going. So I want to just talk now about aerial surveillance. I'm going to talk about uh, five areas, environment, uh, some pest animal monitoring, law enforcement, disaster and emergency and search and rescue. Now, there are an incredible number uh, of other applications in aerial surveillance um, that we can use uh, a drone for. Um, the technology certainly allows that. Uh, the live streaming of vision is a reality now. So the real-time monitoring, the uh, remote uh, capability of a drone is a, is a very real um, thing that can happen now as well. But I'm, we'll talk about these five because I think there's some good examples here and uh, also some things that we've been involved in. So uh, the first one is like the environment. We know that we think of a drone basically takes a... Um, takes a, um, a photo, well, sure. So water water is uh, one of the foundations of life anywhere. In Australia, we have retention ponds where the water is used for different things. Um, previously, the inspections were done at a ground level and uh, were very hard to do. Uh, now we use uh, aircraft to manage the water quality monitoring and through a series of algorithms that have been developed, you can see the outcome on the right-hand side there to quickly determine the water quality of an area. Um, 
algae is an issue for us. Uh, that photo on the right hand side is where because of algae, uh, algae, uh, all the oxygen was depleted and the fish stocks in the area um, were not able to survive. So again, uh, by using it as a surveillance technique in an environmental capacity, then we're able to at least monitor and perhaps intervene before these situations arise. Volumetrics, as you know, you'd be aware of this in terms of the drones are quite um, able to not only measure the um, size of a cut area, but also the size of a, of a filled area as well. And then, of course, LIDAR imaging um, can be done so as well. So there's a lot that can be done in that area. So one of the projects now I'll talk about uh, here, which is a very recent one as well, is a particular problem in this country we have with uh, what are an, in, an introduced species here of animal, which is a fox. Um, they were introduced into Australia in 1855 uh, for sporting purposes, and about 20 years later, they were declared a pest species. Um, to give you an idea of the extent of this problem in the country uh, now, they, ca they cause damage to uh, livestock and infrastructure, uh, well over $200 million a year. Uh, the foxes exist in urban areas as well as the country areas. In some urban areas, they say that there are at least 16 foxes living in every square kilometre, uh, which is quite a lot, and similar numbers when you get into the urban, uh, the uh, rural areas as well. So traditionally, how these were detected were by people going around and trying to find the fox den and then use some sort of temperature device to see if there were a uh, change in the temperature inside uh, the den or the entrance to the den, which would indicate the presence of these animals. Uh, if you can see in the top uh, left-hand corner there, that's what it looks like from a ground level. So it's quite difficult to find these um, the burrows or the dens where the animals are. So we commenced some trials, and this program has now been adopted uh, by using um, thermal cameras on board a drone. So that's a DJI M300, uh, and it's carrying a XT2 IR sensor, so a thermal sensor. Uh, the shot on the right here there is just how we use that flight planning software to tell us that it's okay to fly in that area. So when you look at those things from the air again, and that's the, the rubbish that it's hidden behind, it's still very, very difficult to actually visually determine this. So the time that this was done too, it doesn't have to be done at night. The best time for the flights are just around daylight as well, because um, that's when you, you have some visibility for safety, but you also have a degree of temperature, uh, temperature uh, difference as well. So quite difficult to see there, but uh, once you know where they are, you can see where the den is uh, in the red circle. Thermal imaging helps us detect that. So the thermal imaging is captured. Um, the ambient temperature at that point uh, was nine degrees. So the outside air temperature was nine degrees. There was only a three degree variation at the entrance to where these, uh, where these animals um, uh, were. Uh, once it's processed, we start to get a bit more definition around it. And the end result um, was that visually, once we know where it is, but thermal imaging on the right-hand side there was quite easy to detect that. So this will now be linked to some sort of artificial intelligence program to be able to, to detect that as well. Um, we've successfully done that in the past with the University in Sydney, where we used um, the visual imaging to detect uh, sharks and other dangerous marine animals. So uh, the capability is there, uh, but that gives you a bit of an idea too of how a drone that carries a thermal camera, we all think, well, okay, what do we do with that? What do we look for? But it's a particular use case here, which if it's effective, um, will be applied to what is regarded as a national problem here in Australia. So the next area uh, to talk about is law enforcement. Um, every police service in this country now has adopted this technology. Um, if I go back probably 10 or 15, 15 years um, is when they started to introduce manned helicopters, so helicopters into police um, operations and quickly realised the benefits from an aerial platform. Um, over the last two to three years, drones have been progressively introduced into law enforcement activities and uh, they now, now are an integral part 
of everything that happens. So as I say, it's used across a, quite a number of operations and police have a lot of responsibilities from public order and crime response, search and rescue, forensic activities, um, crowd management, and also monitoring crowd activities for COVID-related uh, activities. So we have, right now, we have a lockdown in process here across um, Sydney and Brisbane. Um, that's uh, the major population centres here. So the drones are being used to monitor uh, people's compliance with that in some areas. So initially, these were introduced for the purpose of crime scene or crash traffic crash reconstruction. But you can see on that motorbike now how first response units as well, so motorbikes are first response units, are being fitted up and carrying drones uh, on board. So it can take us a bit more to look at um, well, thermal imaging and what it can achieve. Um, the video that's showing now was up in a mining area um, in Queensland, and it was a surveillance activity. So we knew that for quite some period of time, people were entering through a, through the side fences, the boundaries, and going in and, and committing criminal acts and, and stealing. So the drones were put in place to conduct um, surveillance flight at night time and, and uh, were able to detect four people coming in to the area, and um, subsequently they were, were detained. So it becomes a very effective platform. But again, thermal imaging or any application still needs to have a use case that it's applicable to. So another thing we've been doing is we've introduced a, an evacuation monitoring program for schools. Um, essentially, what this means is that schools, um, we, we do a lot of work with the schools in, in the training area, but schools are required to have evacuation drills, fire drills, to get to uh, a safe place. One of the concerns was that not everybody is following the designated uh, travel routes or escape routes. So the program has been introduced to simply monitor that to get compliance. Um, and it's become a very effective tool for that. Um, in terms of disaster and emergency management as well, uh, we know that there's a significant number of people lose their life uh, out of disasters. Um, this vision here was given to the operations centre or the control centre for a disaster where they were receiving mixed information about floodwaters covering a bridge. Um, part of the drone, drone surveillance was to go to the area to uh, confirm that or otherwise, but one of the things you can see it picked up from that, which somebody going at a ground level and saying, yeah, the bridge is, the bridge is open, uh, was the ability to detect the power lines in the water there. So, uh, and that vision can be live streamed back to uh, an operations centre where people uh, can make a, a common decision based on what they're seeing. Now, um, this is uh, what our police service does too. This was a, a bushfire that had been started. And um, unfortunately, despite the high risk we have in this country from wildfire, people still deliberately start fires. Uh, we don't quite understand why yet in a lot of cases, but uh, what the police now, and this is drone footage of the fire, what they do now is they release that footage to the public to seek assistance um, to see if they can get any information to determine what happened. So apart from a, an operational command and control perspective, it's also about public, public interaction and uh, trying to get assistance uh, from the public. So, uh, and they're quite, quite active about now, the police service using drones and what they find to engage with the public. So um, this is another little program that uh, was underway too after a wildfire issue. So uh, in 2019-20, uh, we had one of our most catastrophic wildfire seasons ever in the country's history here. Uh, there's about 19 million hectares were burnt. Um, fortunately, uh, only 33 people lost their life but the result on the animal population was that there were about 1.25 billion animals were killed by this fire. Nearly 3 billion were impacted. So it's quite significant. It became quite an emotional issue in the community as well. So drones and quite simple drones um, with a Matic Enterprise uh, with a jewel that has a thermal camera on it being used to go out and detect the heat signatures of koalas in trees um, once they were found, they were monitored from, well, for, well they were mobile, uh, mobile vans that were set up. And uh, basically these koalas that had been injured, 
and uh, and a koala is one of Australia's uh, you know national national uh, wildlife uh, animals. Um, they couldn't uh, do anything to help themselves. They couldn't get out of the tree. They couldn't um, get water or food. So they were sent in and um, a crane went in and performed the rescue for them. So it uh, shows again how um, what was a community issue at the time with the large number of animals that were impacted and injured, how this technology was applied. And it did two things. It not only helped the animal population, but it helped the general community with a sense of uh, well-being and, and helping as well. So it drew the community together at a time after quite a significant disaster that happened in this country. Search and rescue uh, too, and I'll focus on drowning at the first bit here. Um, it's it's a quite a significant thing that happens with drowning. Uh, you can see the third leading cause of death worldwide and half of the drownings that occur are in the Asian and Western Pacific region. Um, 370,000 plus annually that happens as the number. So apart from being uh, a traumatic event on everybody involved, so the, the victims, uh, the victims' families, the responders, and uh, being quite a risky activity to perform rescues, um, these incidents still happen and still happen at high numbers. Uh, so historically in, a, in Australia, um, we have not had a significant change in the way that rescues were done since it was formalised in 1907. We still went into the water uh, to swim out to people. We still put boats in the water and went out to get them. Um, so there was no significant change. And the rescues weren't always effective uh, in terms of what they were doing. So you can see in this case this picture, Two people, three people have been taken by a, a rip current uh, from the beach and the lifeguards had to go out to the end of the rock groin and, and it's got to climb down and enter the water. So one of the focuses that we had then for the drones was how can we make this whole thing safer, not only from a rescue perspective but from a preventative perspective as well. So that journey began in 2015. Um, I'd spent many, many years with our rescue services in helicopters, and that aircraft is the one, uh, the type that I used to be involved in and uh, coordinate the activities of. And uh, Westpac is a bank, a financial institution, and they have sponsored that helicopter service for well over 45, 45 years now. Um, and um, uh, I became involved in about well, 1983, which is 10 years after the inception of the service here. So because of that and because of my involvement in um, rescue services and policing, I got approached by Westpac to say, can we use this new technology of drones to do something? So our, our, um, our task was to take that large helicopter capability and make it small and do the same thing which was never going to be uh, easy and not possible at the early days. And the reasons it wasn't possible was uh, the technology didn't actually exist. The regulatory framework didn't exist. The pilots, the training programs, the rescue pods to be put out of the drone didn't exist. So we had to develop that all from a zero baseline. But we had experience and we had a mission and we had uh, good intent to do that and we had a purpose. So it was actually a four-year program to roll that out. Now, uh, as you can see, the helicopter changed and why it was a helicopter to start with is because the people in the bank um, were familiar with that shape. And if we had put a multi-rotor in front of them at that, that start, um, they wouldn't have understood what that meant. So we put a helicopter in front, it was effective, but certainly not as effective now as the helicopter, as the multi-rotors. To give you an idea too of the cost of that first aircraft, um, we were looking at something like $250,000 Australian for that. And then there was the training costs and the implementation costs. So that capability now and that cost and the cost benefit has reduced significantly with the more common use multi-rotor aircraft. So, um, and it's being used for coastal surveillance and for rescue purposes. So this is a rescue too, and I'll just talk to that. And it was the first time in the world uh, that we're aware of that a unmanned aircraft had actually uh, done this. So 
those two people had been in the water for some 15 minutes. Um, it doesn't look as big on the screen, but the size of the waves was around the two to three metre mark. Um, so, And they're quite powerful waves. Um, they were about 1.2 kilometres or 1,200 metres from a lifeguard station. They'd been there 15 minutes. They were tired. No one knew they were there and they were struggling to get back. So the aircraft uh, was on, on patrol, it located them, it deployed the uh, flotation device. So um, it did what it had to do, it inflated and they were able to hold onto it uh, and return to the shore. So the design of it was for two things. The first was to be able to provide flotation until rescue services came, or the second was to hold onto it as they are there to provide flotation to come back to the shore. So um, it was uh, it was successful in what what we uh, had intended to do. This here too just shows too not in big seas, but the lady there had an injury to her leg. Uh, she wasn't able to get back to the shore. This is the second thing, a uh, second um, process we had. It provided flotation uh, for them. Uh, it was the lady in the green top um, had quite a severe cramp, uh, so wasn't able to get back and uh, a rescue boat was able to come out and uh, collect her and perform the rescue. So it was about that immediate intervention uh, process. So in terms of search and rescue as well, we uh, do work over land as well. The process with land is the same. Uh, this is a training video where we take people and uh, the, the, some of the training exercises, but the intent is still the same. It is about being able to locate people quickly and efficiently, and then to intervene by deploying uh, some type of uh, survival equipment, be it water, first aid kit, communications equipment. Um, obviously, we can't do an extraction yet, but um, we're able to locate and we're also able to deploy. So the skills that are required for this are, are quite high to be able to put the aircraft down amongst the trees uh, to a point where you can get access to it and have that confidence then to deploy an object to the target. A little bit close there, but still it's it's on the target. So um, the work that I've been doing with the uh, passenger carrying aircraft as well is going to be the next stage of this. The first entry point for a lot of those is going to be the humanitarian line and uh, the concept of operations there is to rapidly deploy emergency services to an area, so emergency services personnel, or to be able to perform an evacuation or an extraction. And that's the next stage. Um, in Australia here too, with the passenger carrying aircraft, um, we see the commercial horizon for that to be about 2028. Um, that's not too far away either. So um, a few examples there. But in summary, I'd just like to go through a couple of points here and talk about some of the things that I see as a challenge that needs to be brought together. First of all, the technology is rapidly advancing. Um, the technology life of a product now, um, it's no more than six months. So I think it's changing that rapidly, if that. Um, the commercial life of the product, 12 months as well. So it's a very, very short time frame. When we think we have new technology, 12 months later, it's going to be completely different. The problem with regula regulations or the regulatory environment, the problem that government faces is how do they future-proof any regulations um, to accept this new technology, which brings uh, greater capability? And I think that's where um, the project that we have underway here now with the emerging technologies and the integration and the trials with automated flight approvals, um, that's putting us in the right direction. But already, uh, not even 12 months into that process, so much is already changing. So that is going to be one of the significant cha challenges about how to manage or the regulatory environment around the changes as well. Uh, community acceptance. I think if we went back five years uh, here in this country, there was not a high level of community acceptance for unmanned aircraft uh, because people didn't understand what they did. Uh, now, uh, where we're designing new communities or future communities and uh, building smart cities, 
we're actually starting to integrate uh, the capability for aircraft to operate there, uh, be that with the 5G systems or even with some some capability for unmanned aircraft to be landing or being accommodated at people's houses. So for the delivery concept, uh, privacy is another issue that needs to be dealt with as well. Uh, whilst surveillance or aerial surveillance provides great opportunity, unauthorised surveillance as well provides significant issues there. Any software, uh, and I'm talking about here the software that is being developed uh, through commercial partners, but with the regulator, needs to be user-friendly and being able to be integrated as well. Um, the systems that we have here now for automated flight approvals or just for basic flight planning, um, where they were previously, that you use the systems that um, commercial airline pilots uh, used. Um, now, because the people coming through and using the drones don't have that length of experience or that training opportunity, the software now has become more user-friendly but still delivers the safe, uh, same outcome. Uh, data security is very important too. Um, we now able to transfer images and other data uh, in a live fashion. So that data security is going to become more and more significant as well in what we do. And of course, training. Uh, training has a number of aspects to it, I think. So uh, the jobs of the future around um, unmanned aircraft are going to be for pilots uh, is one thing. There are going to be people who need to be highly trained to operate aircraft in either highly automated or autonomous systems. That is certainly uh, the case, but there are going to be people who need to have skills um, to use a drone in their general employment. So they may not be a drone pilot, they may be an environmental scientist, they may be working in construction, but the drone is going to be used as part of what they do now, as part of that disruptive technology where we saw uh, a mobile phone, we saw a laptop computer, and now we're seeing those people with drones as well. So they're going to be, need to have training or people who are working in companies that simply use drones. So the concept of training uh, people to fly a drone, um, people say to me, how long does it take you to teach me to fly a drone? And I say one or two minutes because it's pretty simple. But they have no understanding of regulations, emergency actions, uh, the proper use of the drone, the application of the software, the programming, or in fact, how they then use it in the job that they want it to do. To do. So there's a lot in the training curve that needs to be brought into this total picture. Um, the use cases, I think there needs to be a valid use case. We see many, many things that people want to do with drones. Not all of them are sustainable, either in an economic sense or in a simply a resource sense or in an end use sense. So it is about also picking, to, until we get to that point where they become more widespread and we reach approach that saturation point, it's about how we actually pick what, um, what uh, jobs or what use case we're going to prioritize. And then above all, we need to be very conscious about having best practice. And best practice um, means that we have safe and secure operations. Um, I've been in aviation for a long, long time now, and when we started in drones, the advice that I was given from CASA is that no matter what you do, so from our Civil Aviation Safety Authority, and this is a foundation principle, no matter what you do, make sure it is safe and make sure it is legal. Uh, and if we keep that as the fundamental tenant of everything we do, then we're going to find that Overall, the acceptance, uh, the use is going to be a lot better than if we go out in an uncoordinated and undisciplined manner. So um, in summary, because uh, it takes us to the end of that, um, there's a lot of, lot of activity in the world of unmanned aircraft. And I think we're reaching the next stage of maturity now in, in, in aerial surveillance. Uh, and that next stage of maturity is that we're finding the different verticals get stronger and stronger. Where we were five or six years ago, everybody was just trying to do everything. And now we're stabilising into uh, very firm verticals of the expertise and the skills developing more and more. So happy to take any questions or discussions. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Eddie. So, um, I have, I mean, while waiting, um, for, I mean, I'm still looking at the chat box whether there's any question or not. But I have a question. This will be kind of like fundamental questions for, uh, for, for you. And then, um, we are talking about the drone application in the, in the, uh, I mean, I mean, the, in area surveillance. So, some of the common questions or some of the things that people will, uh, mean, going to ask is like, um, what kind of like drones that suit for a certain application? So you are talking about the, for example, for example, just now you are talking about uh, the pass, the pass uh, identification, the fox identification. So using M M three hundred with thermal camera, and I believe it's actually to comes together with optical zoom camera. So um, there are, uh, I mean, there are questions. Um, I mean, it's in fact, in our team as well. Uh, is it better, I mean, to have those uh, drones that are available in the market? For example, did, did, I mean, like we, we know that DJI is a very, um, mm. I mean, uh, ready, ready, ready to use in the market. But um, how about customized drone? So uh, what's yeah. your thought on this? Yeah, I've got a pretty, uh, a pretty strong view on that, actually. Um, first of all, you have to take it to the two parts. Uh, the first is the drone. <clears throat> so we need to understand what the drone, and I'll come back and address the question of DJI versus customized in a minute, but we have to understand what do we actually want to do in terms of endurance? How long do we want it to fly for? What do we want it to carry? So what is the payload? And how much um, automation do we need to have for this task? So there's the drone, there's the software, and then there's the payload. Um, the payload is probably the most critical thing when you look at the use case. So many a thermal camera can be attached to pretty well any drone if you have the right connections and the right software. So the thing with DJI and why people tend to use that is because it provides, there's two reasons I think. One, it provides a somewhat out-of-the-box solution and there is no complete out-of-the-box solution. There still is a high level of configuration and either um, attachment of the payloads and configuration of the software to get it to work. So it's not a case of just take them out of the box and get them going. Um, there still is that configuration curve there. And the second reason why they're being used so much is simply because they are so well known around the world and they do provide a reasonably reliable product. Um, I think that there is if you, were to, if you were to, and this is one of the things I've seen over the years why I don't think some companies have been successful, is that they, they have an idea or a use case and then they build a drone specifically for that. But by the time they launch it and get it to market, either the use case has changed or the technology has advanced. Um, I'll take, give you an example. Uh, we, have a, we have a government organisation called the CSIRO here. They're, they're a government... Uh, technology development organization and uh, they actually they actually are responsible for the development of the uh, the wi-fi links that we use around the world now so they, they have a lot of highly technical projects that they do back in about 2016 they had developed software and uh, for highly automated flights so for waypoint flying and they um, and it was it was really simple. You put the waypoints uh, into a screen on the computer, and your controller was two buttons: one to start, one to come back and land. So there was no requirement to do anything. But between 2015 and 2018, they failed to take the product to the market. They spent so much time developing, and they failed to take it to the market. And by the time they took it to the market, they'd been overtaken by a lot of other um, products such as DJI. So um, it's about timing is, is a very important thing. Um, if I had an option to use a custom built product, um, I think I'd, I'd be going that way. Uh, it would be my, my preference. So, but it all comes back to um, what you want to do in terms of the time frame, the area, and what payload you're going to carry. And so if you're going to build a custom-built drone, it needs to have more than one specific application, unless it's a very highly technical application that's, that's going to benefit the commercial return of it or the community, community good from it. So, again, for our rescue drones, um, we've developed and, and we actually went through the patent process, uh, an integrated payload delivery system that is interchangeable across multiple drone frames. Um, 
So the payload device itself is, is where uh, the actual work is done, but we can put it on pretty well any platform, any flying platform. So it's more about, and I think it's about how you integrate the payload onto the drone is very important. All right. Thank you for your insight. I, I I totally agree with you. I mean, there's a pro and cons. And there's a advantage and disadvantage of yep. using the the one that that available in the market and also the one that you need to do on the customer. There drone. is. And yeah. I believe. Um. I, I mean, I've come across with this uh, drone from US. I think the Sky Duo X2. Um, yeah. That's quite fantastic, and I think can be. I mean, can be a good competitor to to DJI as well. So I would like to move into um I mean uh, to the next question I would like to take one of the question from the audience um so uh he, the questions come from Shukri so he's a student uh, he's taking a business degree and he would like to know about uh your insight on drone technology in logistic or maritime industry uh, so I think it's quite a broad question perhaps uh, maybe you can give a little bit of insight and uh, on this question Yep so I think logistics is one of the very strong futures uh, application of drones uh, unmanned aircraft. Um, when you think about logistics, it is about moving something from one point to another. Um, when we originally started and the humanitarian pathway was the entry into that the market, that was sort of a logistics um, operation. Whilst it was regarded as search and rescue, it was logistics of moving a rescue device from one point to somebody to use it to, that they could use it to their advantage so um, i think the future i think the future is going to be the stage one where we're in now is point to point delivery it leaves from one point it goes to another point the next stage will be point to many points it will have a centralized hub it will either use corridors or it will distribute to many points so many many locations that it can distribute to the final stage that i think is going to be where it will end up is many points to many points with the services becoming on demand. So now, as we order a taxi or a hire car, or we ask for a courier to develop, deliver something, there will be drones that will be operating once the energy supply issue has been improved or sold, the drones will be simply operating or at staging points and we will go online and we will request the service. So you won't have to own the drone, um, but the drones will be there operated as an independent service and you'll simply purchase time on that drone to perform a function, a logistics function. I think that is one of the things where it's heading. Uh, particularly anything to, like the maritime industry, anywhere that there's a physical barrier. So again, you start this journey, or we started this journey in the humanitarian process. Um, and when we have floods, the response to floods, floodwaters, was to put a boat in the water to try and cross the floodwaters to deliver medicine or food to somebody, which is an extremely high risk activity. So drones now deliver that and reduce the risk. But that is the same concept now of delivering something in the maritime environment out to an offshore oil rig, to a boat um, that needs spare parts. Uh, it is simply point to point delivery. So I think there's a huge uh, future in two things, either by a large enough organisation um, engaging these services, because there's certainly evidence now of cost reduction um, uh, by doing this. Uh, but also I think one of the arms in the future will be service providers or independent companies that provide this service where organisations just hire the time to do the job when they need it. Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, um, so basically, I mean, you mentioned earlier about the drone delivery. I mean, uh, deliver one parcel or one packaging from one place to another point um, to another point. So, um, I mean, we see that uh, there are a lot of like I would say the use cases. The use successful use cases is with, uh, for example, with Zipline, because they're actually delivering medical uh, deliveries from um, I mean, at the third world country, a friend of second is Rwanda. But um, the question that lingering around, and I would like to, um, I mean, to pick up from the audience itself, and um, to rephrase the, the the question would be like, what do you think about the urban urban deliveries? Uh, urban delivery. We know that Amazon has been experimenting on it. DHL has been experimenting on the urban delivery, and so far, um, I mean, I, I've come I've come across with uh, front of second is Amazon. 
Even though they are talking about the urban delivery, they are still using. Uh, I mean, they are still actually applying the technology uh, in the rural area. For example, because you going to uh, deliver one parcel from one house to another one house, uh, actually quite quite a far distance. So what they actually doing is like they deploy a drone from one point, and then the truck from from the truck itself, and then the truck will mm. go to the point B of the house B, and then the drone will actually go to house A, and then when the the and the drone actually mm. drop off the parcel at house. A, and then we go back to the truck which is actually the truck will be at the house B so something like that so but how about in the in the urban city itself I mean we know that a lot of like challenges there and I mean what's your thought about it yeah well, there's, there's a lot of um, organizations now that are using drones in trials for deliveries uh, DHL Amazon uh, UPS is an American company they're doing last mile delivery trials now so the truck uh, which the vehicle um, will travel down the main road and a drone will do the delivery uh, from the main road to um, to the house. So it's saving time in terms of the actual delivery process. But from an organisation, um, and they have done the numbers on it, but they're saving so, ma- so many kilometres across their fleet per year, which translates into an, a, an economic benefit for that company. So you get a social... Um, social benefit by the package being delivered uh, probably a little bit more quickly, but you're also then getting an overall benefit to the organisation um, by reducing their costs and also reducing, I guess, their carbon footprint by re- the number of kilometres they're driving the vehicles being being uh, reduced. I think that society too, and I know here in Australia, we are slowly being educated uh, as, a, as a society for drones to do deliveries. So we have um, a process here now where, uh, and I'm not sure if you have this uh, in in Malaysia, but we can order online. I'm sure you have that, but we order online and then we can go and collect at a pre-arranged time. Um, now Now we can order online and it will be delivered and it's delivered by a vehicle. Uh, the next step will be we'll order online and it's going to be delivered by a drone uh, to our house because that's where smart cities they're developing now are including that capability for drone deliveries at individual households. So society is changing and getting us accepted, accepting that type of concept. Now, there are some social goods to that and there are some social bads to that, I believe, because if we actually create a society that stays at home and never leaves the house and goes out and doesn't interact and everything's being delivered by a machine, then we have to question the social benefit uh, of that as well. Uh, But there can be times when it's beneficial. And uh, I think if we focus some of the applications back on those humanitarian issues and the trial they're doing here in Australia is about in our rural areas, um, they've set one one central location for pharmaceutical deliveries. Now, what that means, that's the humanitarian line again, but the uh, the drone is capable of doing 130 kilometre uh, delivery uh, of medications. Now, for those people to come into town to do that and go back, given the type of country might take them four hours for a round trip to come in, whereas the drone is completing it in maybe an hour or so. So... In terms of certain locations, it's a benefit. Um, The problem of the problem is one of scale in an urban area, Um, and by that I mean you're going to have for it to be effective, going to have to have hundreds, if not thousands, of drones in the sky um, at any given time to do this, which is a problem. It's a problem for noise, noise, visual safety, coordination whole lot of issues that come out of how you manage that and then the interaction not only with uh, aircraft with crew on board but also things like wildlife birds those type of things so because um, there's a there's a fundamental uh, tenet or principle as well in in aviation is that uh, technology can fail and gravity will win so we need to be very cautious about how we actually go ahead and at the moment we're riding this wave of technology Um, and saying it's great, but there are some challenges from a social application uh, as well. Great, great. I I, I mean, I totally agree with your insight here, I mean, with your opinion. Um, 
because I mean there are a lot of challenges to actually to I mean even though drone technology is kind of like very beneficial to a certain aspect but there are a lot of like challenges that we need we also need to think about on the on the safety aspect also on the what you mentioned earlier and um yeah I mean when you actually uh, talking about there will be a thousand of drones flying to do all these kind of like application not only on the delivery and some of the other stuff mm. um i mean it goes back to the uh, i mean to the application of what we have been show uh, earlier on the utm the unmanned traffic management software so um i think that's actually quite interesting because in malaysia we haven't actually uh, deployed that and um, i mean uh, i mean can you elaborate more i mean what kind of, i mean because i have a questions uh, from from my colleague is like Hey, that's look interesting. So, what kind of software is it being developed by Casta itself, or is it being developed by the local, I mean, the Australians uh, government yeah, yeah. and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, those software applications are not being developed by Casa. They're being developed in cooperation or partnership with Casa. So, they are private, commercial organisations that uh, have developed it, and um, um, Casa endorses or approves that. Um, as software that can be promoted and used in this type of activity. So uh, there were four providers of it, uh, only one, um, what I showed you before about the automated airspace approvals for controlled airspace, there's only one provider that is trialling that at the moment. And I would expect that uh, if the trial is successful, that that will be rolled out uh, or continued across all the controlled um, aerodromes, so all those with air traffic control. Because when you think about it, um, all that's happening is when you when you lodge a flight plan for a manned aircraft, it goes into the system and the air traffic controller sees that flight plan and expects that aircraft to do certain things at that, that time. When you do it for an unmanned aircraft, uh, providing the person is um, uh, licensed, they're approved by CASA to do that type of operation, they're just simply lodging a flight plan to advise the air traffic controller uh, that, that an unmanned aircraft is going to um, to occur at that time. So uh, I think it's a natural progression, but it requires... Uh, CASA, CASA is a regulatory body, uh, and they're very smart in what they've done. Instead of trying to develop the software, they're not software developers. They've engaged software developers to do it. And uh, by working together, they're going to get a, uh, hopefully a very, very good outcome. Um, the key to this too is that if you look at statistically in uh, manned aircraft operations, and this goes back many, many years, decades, 100 years, is that probably around 80%, 80% of issues or incidents that have happened relate to human factors, relate to the person. So the, the, the amount of technical failure that caused a major or an air incident or an air crash or an air incident is very low. It related back to human factors of pilot training, pilot decision-making, fatigue, um, the wrong attitude in the cockpit. So that's here in Australia as well, a focus of what we're doing here is to make sure that those human factors are um, are accommodated in, in any sort of the operations as well and not a pure dependence on the technology. So there always still has to be a person involved, but how that person conducts themselves, their decision-making process um, is a very, very important thing. And the other thing that hasn't happened yet anywhere in the world um, um, like in the manned aircraft is we have not had a catastrophic incident yet with an unmanned uh, aircraft. So uh, we need to be very, very careful and cautious that the technology is racing ahead, the use cases, the application is racing ahead, but we need to make sure we keep it safe um, for the industry because a catastrophic incident involving an unmanned aircraft is going to have a significant adverse effect on what we're doing. But having said that, automation, collision avoidance, unmanned traffic management systems, they're bringing, uh, they're, they're reducing that risk significantly and very quickly as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the very good explanation. Um, yeah, I mean, I have these questions about uh, people who are, I mean, they are saying that they are, 
they don't have experience they don't have knowledge and then um i mean to, to i mean operate operating on the drone or, or knowledge about drone and whatnot so uh, based on your experience i mean of course from i mean for ourselves i mean we have been training um, those people who don't have that experience and knowledge about drone and they can become the professional drone operator but uh, let's hear from you from you i mean you you are you i mean from the australian uh, people is there anyone that who don't have uh, or have zero knowledge or zero technical uh, mm. uh, expertise to actually operate a drone and from your from your knowledge is there anyone that coming from zero and become a professional drone operator sure absolutely um and i'll give you an example of one of the programs that we're doing here We work with uh, with high school students. They're in year 11 or 12, which is their final two years of secondary school before they either go to the workforce or they go to university for higher education. Uh, we run a course that goes over nine months where we take them through training. So they enter that course with, with uh, zero experience, zero knowledge about aircraft uh, the aircraft legislation the environment the applications they just know that it's a new technology and that someday they're going to be exposed to it and they need to be involved with it or there may be some people who have a drone and they've been using it for fun so in the commercial application of it and the level of knowledge that's required to do that or the skills they have zero uh, we take them through this program and at the end of that program they'll come out with a Australian nationally recognised vocational qualification. They'll come out with their industry licence, which is the CASA Remote Pilot Operator Certificate and also their Aeronautical Radio Operators Licence. Uh, the second stage of that program, so, so we've basically got them some skills to fly a drone now. So um, the question then remains, and why we introduced this program was because the question was always, After you gave someone the flying skills and knowledge, the question was always, what do I do now? How do I get a job? What do I do with this? So when we uh, started training, we felt quite quite um, shallow or not so good because we'd trained people and what do we do now? So we expanded the program into what we call as an internship program. So we have um, developed relationships with businesses or commercial organisations that um, think that they may benefit from the use of drones. And what happens is that the students that we've trained, we actually supervise or mentor them in doing work with these organisations. So the organisation gets to experience, is a drone beneficial? Should I pursue this? The student who has the knowledge now to fly a drone gets to experience the commercial reality of actually doing a job and the need to get commercial outcomes for an organisation, understanding how the business is run. So um, it's quite possible to take someone with absolutely no experience and make them high quality um, commercial operators. Right, thank you. So to the audience that asking about this question, so don't be afraid. Uh, basically, you guys can be a professional drone operator, and I mean, you can find a colorful and successful career ahead of you. So don't 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 be afraid to jump to jump into the boat. Um, I have two last questions. Um, the first, I mean, the the I mean, my second final question. Um, you have mentioned the law enforcement. Um, they are also using drone. Um, and uh, for the monitoring and and so forth. Um, I mean, but um, in Malaysia we also have a similar uh, application where our police uh, officers they actually using drone to do uh, public announcement and somehow yeah. like monitoring whether there are people gathering and whatnot. But Um, I need your input here. I mean, what are the are the other extensive application for this law enforcement during this COVID nineteen? What they, what else that they can do uh, using the drone that they already have? Yeah. So um, there are two parts to the drone. One is surveillance, and the other is payload delivery. So depending on what application it is. So whether it's law enforcement uh, in terms of crowd control, um, civil unrest, uh, crime prevention, um, search and rescue, disaster management. Surveillance is a common factor across all of those aspects. The capability to, so and, and the surveillance 
device, the camera, is a part of the payload. Um, a secondary part of the payload can include delivering something. So there have been a few examples of things that have happened, um, right down from delivering information pamphlets uh, from a drone through to uh, when you have some of the high-risk tactical teams about resupply ammunition to them. So uh, there's plenty of examples around about how it can be used. So I think it's a case of not trying to say, what can the drone do? What's the use case? What do we need to achieve? What could a drone with its capabilities of a camera and a payload delivery device help us uh, do? I think one of the important things that could be done as well, and uh, I was involved uh, with this in New Zealand with the police helicopter um, operations over there, is that they had a public um, awareness campaign that the police when they are using helicopters. And because of the way they did that, any time a helicopter was heard in the air, the public didn't know whether that was a police helicopter or some other operator. And it was proven over a period of time that there was a reduction or a shifting of locations of crime uh, somewhat of a reduction because people, and it's it's about opportunity crime. So and that means people who just take the opportunity to do something wrong. So in a law enforcement capacity, if someone was going to do something wrong and they heard a helicopter, they didn't know, was that a police helicopter or what was it? And they assumed it was a police helicopter and most times didn't commit the crime. So the similar type of thing can happen with a drone too. With the number of drones that are out there, they can be specifically used by the police, which... Um, police are a limited, limited resource. They can't be everywhere and do everything. But drones, there are so many of them out there too. So um, perhaps with an active marketing campaign or a public awareness campaign about the police using drones, and I take you back to that footage that I showed of the bushfire released by the, our state police. Part of that was to try and say, can someone help us with this problem? But it's also to create public awareness when you hear a drone that might be the police drone, and that's a crime prevention strategy. So um, you can actually do things with the drone, but um, itself, or you can create the perception as well uh, of what's happening there. Um, the best policing but is for people, police to be out there and moving around in the community and engaging with the community. That's the best stuff. The drone just becomes another tool that they have available to gather information or do something rather than a replacement for the police. Thank you, thank you. Um, my last question to you before we wrap up the, uh, before, before we wrap up the session. Um, I mean, you have shown to us like there's a certain um, certain operation that involves the law enforcement, for example, in terms of the wildlife and then in terms of the wildfire search and rescue and so forth. Uh, my curiosity here, um, I mean, does or I mean does the public itself I mean you have uh, you mentioned last time to me is that you have about a thousand eight or maybe close to two thousand professional drone operators and actually they are registered with Kassan as well so um, are there any chances of these uh, professional drone operators or the recreational drone operators get involved into this kind of operation uh, for example like the wildfire and the search and rescue uh, because we know um, some people especially Malaysia Malaysia when we have uh, like this kind of like lockdown I mean they're all eager to fly and they actually want to contribute something to the to the nation and they say hey I can help you to to monitor this I mean all these kind of like things so does I mean how, how I mean do you have this kind of like situation in Australia where the public actually contribute to the law enforcement yeah, by yeah, doing this do. This, yeah, yeah, we do. We do. It's 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 an absolutely common thing. That people want to help in times of crisis. Um, the challenge from a law enforcement or an emergency response um, situation is, at the time of the crisis, it's very very hard to bring people on board that you haven't worked with, that you haven't had contact with before. Because remember I, said, remember, I said it still needs to be safe. It still needs to be legal. So um, we had problems here, and not just in drones, just in people turning up to help during a crisis that had no contact before with that service. So it was very, very difficult to use them. And what happened was their skill set was, was very high in some areas, but because that contact wasn't there, because they didn't under, understand the procedures, they didn't understand the limitations, 
or how the operation was going to be handled, they were still involved, but they were given quite uh, routine tasks that didn't use their skill set. So if somebody turned up on the day the crisis was happening with a very advanced drone and said, I'm here to help, um, there's probably a tremendous benefit from that. But the issue is, I think the, the, the police service who are making the decisions to use that may be thinking, we don't know this person, we haven't worked with them before, which can actually be a hindrance. So um, it's good to engage before, because as I said, the police, the emergency services can't be everywhere, can't do everything. So there needs to be a level of engagement before so they understand who you are, what you got, what you can do. And then at the time of the crisis, um, you actually do the job, not having to work out how we're going to do the job. Um, one of the things we're doing here, we've um, just been appointed as the training organisation for our fire and emergency service uh, for the state. Um, so we're going to be training all the fire service officers uh, and the disaster officers uh, in the use of unmanned aircraft. Um, um, one of the challenges there is going to be exactly what you're talking about is that that community, the community, there are many thousands of drones out there and they want to get, they're going to want to be involved when something goes wrong. So the second stage of all this is making sure that that community has the skills or the knowledge about how the organisation works and what service it needs to do because we can all get overtaken very quickly in the emotion of the moment, but we also want to make sure that the people who are coming to help are kept safe as well and don't cause future problems. Okay, thank you very much. We have been live for, I would say, more than one hour. I would say one, and one hour, close to one hour, 20 minutes. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you, Mr. Eddie Bennett, for his time. Um, so to share with us uh, on the drone application in the area civilian and what he's been sharing about the Australian uh, aviation, the drone industry in, uh, in Australia, the regulation as well. So uh, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Eddie. And then to My all pleasure. the to all the viewers uh, and the audience in our Zoom meeting to the Facebook um, live uh, audience, uh, stay tuned with us uh, next week and the next upcoming week where we're going to share with you more session uh, about drone and the insight about drone maybe in the Malaysia or the other countries as well. So to all the Malaysian out there, please stay safe. Uh, so take care of your help and just go out for the necessary stuff and um, that's all from us. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you everyone.